their new home had been specially bought for them. And 50 years later, some return for a reunion dinner and to remember their lives there. He worked for the Jewish agency as uh, going around the kibbutzim to advise on chicken breeding. Oh, did he? Oh, yes. This is a greeting to all Jewish people from here. I've seen him once uh, when I went for a walk on the towpath. You know, the, no, I didn't. No, the towpath going from, you know, Leeds to Liverpool. Lift your glasses. Look at him. Look at him. Well, anyway, let's him. Most of the children were parted from their parents and their possessions forever. It happened suddenly and cruelly. On the, I don't know, 3rd, 4th of December, we got a message from one of the Jewish organizations that 500 children were to be allowed to go to England and 500 to Holland, and that I had been chosen to be one of them. As I tell people, I won the biggest raffle in the world, I won my life in a raffle. We all had to go to this big building in the centre of Berlin. It was filled with SS men, and I remember I was very frightened. They made you feel very, like criminals actually, you had your fingerprints taken, and then photographed from the front, and then from the side so that your left ear was showing. It wasn't for the visa, it was for the identity card. The ones where we also had our additional name added to us, you know, women got Sarah and the men, Israel. And one other identification essential to the Nazis, their mark for the Jew. On uh, uh, the 10th of December, uh, mother took us to the station, lots of uh, children there, very sad. I'm surprised uh, at our insensitivity. We were mm -hmm. so relieved at being able to go we didn't even understand fully, perhaps, our mother's tears. Only one parent was allowed to go to the, out of the station or even the vicinity. So I said goodbye to my mother in a little side street, miles from the station. That's the last I ever saw of her. I've met people since who knew my mother in Brussels, and one fellow said to me, I'm surprised the streets aren't still wet with the tears of your mother. The last summer was at the, at the railway station. We were allowed one suitcase, and I can't remember now what was in it, but the usual things, sheets of clothing. And I remember my mother gave me a, a talisman, uh, which was a sort of, uh, about the size of a, of a silver cigarette case with a, with a picture in it. And there was an inscription in it, uh, Love me always, Mum. I'm afraid uh, it's, it's been lost since then. At Nuremberg, there were some women on the platform and they handed us uh, cocoa and biscuits, but I think they thought that we were Hitler youth. And had they known who it was, I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> Hardly knowing why, not knowing where to, it truly was a journey into the unknown, with only each other for comfort. Even friendly British places and people held terrors for these strange young visitors. I was put on the train at King's Cross by uh, somebody who ferried me across London. And just before the train set off, uh, one of the people entering the compartment was uh, a man who was wearing a brown shirt, which I didn't know at that time was a very, very common garb for, for, for working people in, in England. Now, I had been conditioned that if you saw a chap in a brown shirt, you made yourself scarce as fast as you could. And here I was sitting across from this man all the way up uh, to Bradford. He, I think he got out at Doncaster or somewhere on route. And uh, obviously I was very fidgety on, on, on my seat. When I got out of the train and was taken through the streets of Bradford and saw what was then all blackened houses, even coming from the industrial rural with heavy industries, this struck me as, as, as certainly a, a, a very sombre place. None of us had heard of Bradford. Indeed, uh, today many in London haven't heard of Bradford. 
obviously it, it, it was a very much uh, industrial town. I don't think we were so concerned of what the, I myself anyway, what the town looked like. We were far more concerned what was happening to us and the people around us. The response was swift and generous from the Bradford Committee of the Council for German Jewry. It was led by Ozzy Stroud, who, with fellow businessman Sidney Baker, bought the hostel for £3,000. Donations towards the furnishing, decoration and running costs crossed all boundaries of faith, class and means. In this way, and by blessing and prayer, Number 1 Parkfield Road was made ready for the children who were coming. They didn't know what they were coming to. They knew what they'd come from, but they didn't know what they were coming to. And I think they were absolutely stupefied. I remember distinctly one little boy, and I don't remember who it was, he'd no pyjamas. And I went running round to all the other boys, has anybody got two pair of pyjamas? But they were ersatz. In any case, they were rubbish, they were hard, they were horrible, and we all felt so sorry for these poor little mites because all they had was a very small case about this size. One of the ladies, uh, she went through my suitcase and uh, I still remember that expression on her face, an expression of absolute, you know, how shall I put it? I don't know whether disgust is the right word. It must have been a horrible mess in that suitcase. Anyway, we got, uh, well, we got all fixed up and, uh, and well, we, uh, we gradually fitted into the routine of things at the hostel. A well-ordered, secure life had to be established. A set of house rules and a committee to bring calmness to the chaotic childhood of the 24 boys and Ruth, the hostel warden's daughter. On the whole, the committee were all very kind and very hard. They'd roll out their sleeves in the kitchen and, and really help. Uh, there were there was one member in the committee wasn't um, who was a little different. She, for instance, was very keen on making sure that my mother was doing everything very in the kosher way, and she'd have a spy amongst the boys. One of the boys was told he'd have to go into the kitchen now and then and pretend he was doing something else, and watch that my mother was doing everything right, and then report back to her. Well, obviously, when my parents found out about that, they were very upset and things like that. It was a hard life for them, very worrying at times. The returning former refugees can still see the past through the present-day hotel. Oh, allow me. Right. Yep. Avraham. Right. I'm behind Ruth. Oh, that's lovely. I'm glad they haven't changed this. No, it's still the original. Yes. That's where Colin and I lived. Games room? Yes. Where to go in? Yes, yes let's have a look. Table. Yes, we used to play table tennis. Table tennis oh, yes. table. Table tennis, yes, yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. What I else? think we could have put up a good team in table tennis. Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, uh, well, Jeffrey and I represented the messenger boys of the civil defense. Did you? We were the two leading players of their team. <laughs> well, poker, bridge, chess and table tennis, we, the boys, could have fielded very strong teams, couldn't we? <laughs> now, this reminds me of the good old days. Do you remember? Yes, we were yes, all busy indeed. down yes, there, and yes. I, as a little girl, would sneak out here as soon as there was some commotion, and I could look down and see what was going on. It was great. Oh, yes. Did, did you ever hear anything compromising? Probably, yes. Probably. <laughs> Probably wait till there was something interesting. Yes. And you could even see the corner where everybody used to congregate down oh, there. Oh, yes, yes. Around the stove. They treated oh, yes. me like a sister, like I looked upon them as brothers. And a sister can be a nuisance and a brother can be a nuisance at times as well. But on the whole, I think they were, they were very kind and very good to me. Some more so than others, because I think they left their sisters behind and in me they saw their own sister, where she might she be now and this sort of thing. Yeah, many happy memories. They used to tease me a lot and I had plaits at the time and of course it's so tempting, isn't it, to pull somebody's plait. And this went on quite often actually, pulling my plaits. And one day, I remember this, one of them just pulled my plait again and then they tried to run away, you see. 
and I got round. I turned round so quickly, I got him. And next minute, there we were, had a lovely fight, wrestling on the floor. And of course, all the other boys loved it, all standing around and cheering. Come on, come on, Hannah, you're winning. And this went on. And then my parents appeared, luckily, probably, and put a stop to all this excitement, and I was rescued. But nobody pulled my plaits again after that. I thought twice. Uh, the next song you may well know, it's one of the first songs that, Yiddish songs that I learned when I was young. And it's a children's song, it's about children learning their Aleph bass, the Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> Britain, aroused to the danger of fifth column activities, must take no chances. However, to be interned in Britain is like paradise when compared with a Nazi concentration camp, so there shouldn't be any complaints here, even if the internees have literally to make their own beds and take in each other's washing. They'll get perfectly decent treatment and plenty to eat. But obviously, the country must protect itself against the fifth column. In 1940, with Britain alone and at bay, spy fever gripped the country. Thousands of so-called enemy aliens, including five of the hostel boys, were taken into custody. One early morning in May 1940, when we looked out of our windows, we noticed that the play hostel was surrounded by police, who eventually, of course, came to the door and asked all the boys over 16 to report immediately for internment and asked us to bring our cameras and binoculars down as they were going to be confiscated for the duration of the war as we were considered to be enemy aliens. We were driven in a, by car, first of all, to, to Harrogate, which was a proper prisoner of, prisoner of war camp. I, and yes, I, I remember that. We, we stopped there in, in, in Harrogate for, for, for a few days before we were mixed off to, uh, we, to, to the Isle of Man. It was a camp which was uh, bound by double row of barbed wire was out and of course they were, was guarded by, by, by soldiers. And uh, we organized ourselves, you know, in these houses and inside on the Isle of Man. And every morning we had to go to the, uh, to, we were given rations for the day. And then we organized ourselves, somebody cooked and somebody cleaned the huts, etc. It was rather, well, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a holiday. And while my parents were in turn to the Isle of Man, we, we were... You say your parents, your mother, no. My grandfather. Your mother was in turn as well. were in turn. They were, the horse is Austrian. What am I signing away, Alan? The evening's formal speech, a quiet thanksgiving perhaps, was given by Geoffrey Phillips, a food wholesaler from Dublin. Is this working all right? Is it on? My first and foremost duty is on behalf of all of us here tonight to thank Albert and Lily. Yeah. Whatever I can say will not pay sufficient tribute to the tremendous amount of work that they've put into it. And indeed, it was Albert's original idea to bring us all together after all these years. And without him, we just would not be here tonight. We all, by the mercy of God and the generosity of strangers, came first of all to England and ultimately to this house and managed to escape uh, to freedom 
unto life before the curtain went up on the final act of the tragedy which engulfed not only our own families and friends but practically the whole of Jewry which lived in continental Europe. And although we were fortunate to be only on the fringe of what today is usually called the Holocaust and did not experience its full agony, we are nevertheless living witnesses of this tragic page in the history of our people. And as I discussed with some of my ex-hostel boys here tonight, whether we face it or not, it has left some sort of mark on all of us. We are acutely conscious of the fact that whereas man has the capacity to create works of breathtaking beauty or the most intricate technical complexity, he is also capable of building gas chambers, whereas men can be inspired lives of selfless idealism they can also be indoctrinated to commit the most heinous evil. Uh, so much of the serious reflection on what brought us together. Uh, I know that being together here will evoke a lot of reminiscences and memories and uh, not only will we remember things which happened long ago and which had almost been buried in the limbo of forgetfulness, but we find out what has happened to each one of us. And again, looking around and hearing the live stories, I think by and large we haven't done too badly. Using the words of Fiddler on the Roof to life, to health, Lachaim. I haven't got a glass. <laughs> I think it was a very good exercise because it did, it forced them to think about it and bring back the past a little. Because I think some of the boys had put it away and just not wanted to remember those days. Naturally, it was rather an emotional occasion. Uh, when we came over, of course, we had no idea at that time that uh, war was absolutely imminent, as we were youngsters, you see. Yes, yes. We knew something was up and um, that uh, most of us would never see our folks again. And uh, naturally, it's a very traumatic thing sure. to uh, go back to, because I personally had never come to terms with it. No, no. Because, um, you know, if somebody gets shot or blown up, it's very tragic. Yeah. But it's a one-off. It happens, and then, OK, that's the end of it. But to have your uh, loved one um, in a situation where they're, uh, as we soon found out, systematically starved and um, degraded and herded together in vermin-ridden conditions and all that kind of thing, and uh, maybe tortured, and uh, how they met their end, nobody ever knows. Now, if you, if you, if you were to dwell on that, you, um, well, it, you know, it could unhinge you. But I never, I never was able to, uh, to, to take it, in fact. What I did <clears throat> was to um, slam the gate, slam the door on the whole chamber of horrors and throw away the key. I kept away from um, my, um, the people, you know, that uh, were in a similar situation. I threw myself into the war effort, and um, I couldn't wait to get that, um, that old adult to do my bit towards getting rid of him. 
Most of the boys took that view. As soon as they were old enough, they joined up, some into the more glamorous branches of the armed forces, some into the less, and one at least wearing his uniform with Jewish humor as well as with pride. To begin with, I was in the King's Only Oxalite Infantry, but when I got over to uh, Belgium and Holland, I was actually transferred to the, believe it or not, the uh, 51st Highland Division. I finished up wearing a kilt and uh, laid claim to being the only Yiddish Yorkshireman from Germany in the Highland Division. And uh, if you look over there, you can actually see a painting which was done by a German prisoner of war in northern Germany waiting to be demobbed, and uh, he just got a few cigarettes for it. Ruth Simmons, a retired microbiologist, lives in Harrogate. She pursues her gentle hobbies and has come to terms with the shadows of the past, although she can't completely banish them. I don't blame them for anything. First of all, it's a new generation. And besides, I think it could happen anywhere, anywhere in the world, that sort of thing. But I can't bear to hear the, the German national anthem. Any films with Hitler on, and a lot of films have been on television lately, that I usually finish up in tears because either I think it could have been me and I've, I get very upset. Okay, so, so are you finished now then? Yes, oh yes, the contract's finished now. The feelings I have towards the Germans are certainly not those of hate or vengeance, not in any way, shape or form. Mainly because I realize that not only can't you hate all your life, but that also hate damages the people that hate. I felt in some difficult to describe manner Sorry for the SA man and the SS man who hit me and my brother and my father and my mother just because I was Jewish. My relationship with uh, uh, Germans today is that I'm uh, very conscious of uh, not wanting to be hypocritical in any uh, shape or form. I am... Um, ready to transact business with them. I have no particular uh, hate for the Germans of today. And uh, whilst at the time I uh, pondered about the question of having a German car, uh, I did decide that it, it was uh, the type of car which I wanted and, and I bought it. And I'm very, very happy indeed and I've got no hang-ups about it. I've never bought anything German since the war. For a start, I can't afford a Mercedes. But uh, no, after the war, I wouldn't in principle, and it's just, just gone. I don't consciously buy one, and, but uh, at the same time, I've never told my children or anyone else, don't buy German goods. I leave that up to them. Once we went to, on a holiday to Austria and Italy. First we went to Italy, which I enjoyed very much. And when we went cost to cost to Austria, I felt uncomfortable every minute I was there. Just didn't like it. I was waiting for the minute to get out again. Every person I looked at, I, I felt, what did they do? The next song is a Yiddish song again. Zol Schoen Kummen de Gula. It's one of my favourite Yiddish songs. It's written by a partisan of Vilna. And the song is very moving and inspiring for me because it says that out of great times of distress and despair can come hope and eventual salvation.
By 1943, only ten boys were left at the hostel, and a year later it became a guest house and subsequently the hotel of today. But for that one girl and all the boys, the hostel and Bradford will forever be landmarks in their lives. Bradford has become my home, has been my home for a long while. And I suppose you now it will be my home to the day I die. You know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, well, I shall, uh, uh, well, I've reached 65 this week and I shall shortly have to retire, but I shall be quite happy to spend my retirement uh, living uh, in Bradford or near Bradford. You can look at it as, as a base, you know, where one has learned to grow up, where one has been helped uh, to face the future, which was so uncertain for us. And where so many people have uh, tried to help us to come to grips with the new life and new culture. And uh, I suppose in that, in that way it, it is a symbol of, uh, to me, a security. <laughs>